Good afternoon, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about providing infrastructure for a growing city. We're fortunate to live and work in Auckland at a time when we can be part of Auckland growth. Today, we're going to discuss the fascinating challenge of ensuring the infrastructure is in place to create the vision for Auckland. Auckland's population. As you can see, Auckland's forecasts show growth of 400,000 people in the next 20 years. This is in no way an insignificant task. 400,000 people is the same as the size of Wellington. So introductions on why we are here today. I work at the pointy end of coordinating how we enable and pay for the infrastructure capacity for some of the large growth areas in Auckland. I see the reality. Michael sees the reality of working out how to pay for this infrastructure. We're the people at the coalface of solving the infrastructure we need for growth and how to pay for it. We can't hide behind theoretical discussions about solutions. We've got to actually achieve real solutions and systemic-wide solutions. So the fascinating challenge we live every day is how do we deliver on the infrastructure to enable it growth. No infrastructure capacity means no growth. And we want and need growth for Auckland and for New Zealand. Before I continue, I'm going to say, there's nothing simple about the infrastructure challenge to enable growth. Why? Infrastructure growth is complex, and business as usual is not working. Some of you here may be thinking, but we've solved this infrastructure challenge, haven't we? We have new tools in IFF and UDA, haven't we? I would say they may help, but there are still gaps. Gaps in understanding what infrastructure we need and gaps in how to pay. Some of you here may be thinking, if only local government or central government or developers or landowners would sort themselves out, we'd have this solved. I would say this isn't something that one party can solve. We need to solve this together. Today, we're going to explain why we're saying these things, that the infrastructure problem isn't yet fixed, we've made real progress, but we, that's all of us, have way more work to do to solve the infrastructure system. This discussion could be hours long, but we only have 20 minutes. We'll only talk about a few key points. We'll talk about the practical and real issues, and they are deeply understood and deeply complex. So, some context. Growth requires infrastructure, roads, water, wastewater, stormwater, and the more visible things like parks and community facilities. To enable growth, we work out what infrastructure we need, and then we pay for it. Sounds simple, but in reality, it's way more complex. What are some of these complexities? Firstly, quantifying what infrastructure is needed is complex. Every area is totally different. Different assets existing, geotech, soils, growth, different place in the network. To understand what's needed requires detailed modeling and experts to unpick what's needed. And it takes time and funding. And it needs to be done spatially. There is no point putting in roads but not putting in the stormwater. Secondly, there are many people and many processes associated with infrastructure. All have an important role, but the key is coordinating everything together. Thirdly, infrastructure is long-term, Politics are short term. Fourthly, growth in Auckland is happening everywhere. The way our land use systems work, private plan changes and upzoning, drives growth everywhere. We don't have a system of controlled growth, so infrastructure capacity is cried in many, many areas. And our infrastructure has to some way cope with this. Fifthly, infrastructure is inherently complex. Pump stations and pipes just don't look exciting but drawing plans and visions do, and somehow, as a result, the level of knowledge about infrastructure and how it fits across all its facets isn't always top of mind when we're doing policies and plans and visions, but it's totally fundamental to growth. And the final one I'll mention trumps everything. Infrastructure just costs a lot of money. We need the funding and financing mechanisms for infrastructure that will work in a coordinated way. So the complexities, many won't be, they're not new to many of you here, 
But what I see is how the com complexities add together and we have to solve them as a whole. If you solve one, then another one pops up. The key is solving the whole system of complexities. And that's a real solution and not a theoretical one. Let's try and bring this to life. I'm going to talk through some examples. I'm going to talk through a brownfields and a greenfields. And they nicely match with what Minister Robertson talked about this morning in Tamaki and Drury. So brownfields. In Auckland, we have a wonderful vision to enable growth through intensification and regeneration in brownfields. Where are we at with this? Zoning is enabled. Awesome. Auckland Unitary Plan enabled the growth. Some of the big enabling infrastructure is underway, CRL, Central Interceptor, Kainga Ora and Crown support areas such as Tamaki, Mount Roskill and Mangere. Crown and Council working together, great. All infrastructure in place to support the growth? Mm, not quite there yet. We've made progress, but that's what we need to solve. So let's see where we're at. I'm going to talk about Tamaki. Lots of you know about Tamaki. It's a great example of brownfields regeneration. There's many landowners and significant land ownership by Tamaki Regeneration Company. And the vision is for regeneration, intensification, and transformational change. The vision is for growth from 20,000 to 60,000 residents. So an increase in population of 40,000 and more than 12,000 homes across Tamaki. And with growth, we need infrastructure. But how much and how do we want to pay for this? Again, some context. Firstly, Tamaki isn't set up for growth. Much of the area was built in the 40s and 50s, built and paid for by the Ministry of Works for servicemen coming back from overseas. That's what the infrastructure capacity in Tamaki is set up for. It was not built for the growth, the urban form, and the level of service outcomes we require and want today. And the assets are now old. Secondly, no area is the same as Tamaki. Every single area in Auckland is different. Taking a broad estimate of what's needed doesn't work. You have to get down to every single project that's needed. Every pipe, every pumping station, every road intersection. We've had to do the detailed, time-consuming, and important work to understand this and understand what 12,000 new homes means and what is the gap. What have we learnt? Well, we've learnt that in 2016, we thought the infrastructure was costed at $80 million. We now think it's closer to a billion. That's a significant increase. We've learned that that's bulk and local infrastructure. It's the full cost, so some of it will be council, some of it will be developer mitigation, but it's close to a billion dollars. Why this increase? We've done the detailed work. We've collaborated across the Auckland Council Group with Crown, with Crown entities to really unpick what's going on. We've ploughed through microfiches of 1940s infrastructure. We put cameras down pipes. We found things in places we weren't expecting. And we've done extensive modelling. We've taken our policies, master plans and visions, and we've costed them. We have lists of hundreds of detailed projects that we need. And the, the results are a significant infrastructure cost. At 80 million, coming up with an infrastructure financing and funding solution is totally different to one needed for a billion dollars. Tamaki has provided us a wonderful opportunity to understand what's needed for widespread redevelopment in brownfields in Auckland. Much of Auckland's growth is small. It's piece by piece by piece that cumulatively together adds up to significant growth. What this means for infrastructure has not been fully unpicked. Tamaki has been. It's been invaluable for us to understand the specific problem of the area, but also the wider systemic issues that it throws up for Auckland. So now we're at the how do we pay for it. Michael will come back to this later in the presentation. The second example I'm going to talk about is Greenfields and its Drury. The vision is for opening up an area to create 22,000 new dwellings and 12,000 new home, new jobs. In terms of scale, we think about creating another Napier. Where are we at? 
we have the vision of an integrated public transport enabled network that is needed to create a thriving Drury. We understand this in detail at full build out. The Supporting a Growth Alliance work has been pivotal to this understanding. We have insights about the other infrastructure that's needed. We have a structure plan. We have some areas zoned and some areas not. We have the New Zealand Upgrade Program, providing funding for key enabling infrastructure such as Mill Road and Drury Stations. And we have private plan changes in play currently. We know that we have infrastructure that at full build out will cost a great deal of money. Let's bring this to life. Currently, Drury isn't densely populated. There are some existing residents, some areas that are growing, the Oranga Township, Drury South Industrial Area, and a great deal of farmland. Where a Drury West Station is planned, there are fields of cows. The vision is that in the future, this will be a sea of houses, residents, and bustling town centers. So the infrastructure needs are massive. We know we need to widen bridges, improve safety, put in bus lanes, cycle lanes, turn a farming area into a town to create a joined up public transport enabled network. Putting in orphan infrastructure that doesn't complete a network will not prove successful. For Joy, that comes at a significant price tag. For example, we've scoped 10 arterial roads, road upgrades, extensions, new roads, their cost, well over a billion dollars. That's to support the urban environment that we have the vision for. Again, a billion dollars, that's a huge number. Then you have to add in all the other infrastructure needs that are additional to the transport. As in the Tamaki example, we've done lots of the steps needed to create the infrastructure to enable growth. And in both cases, we're at the solving the money question and solving how do we stage and sequence this. Michael would talk further about this. Why BAU doesn't work for funding and financing and how to use the new tools we have and where we go next. Thank you. Kia ora koutou. As Bridget said, Auckland is an exciting place to be. People want to live here and the growth presents great opportunities and great challenges. In the council finance team, we see the impacts of this growth in many ways. We see revenue from consents, and the mayor referred this morning to our record consenting month of September. We see renewals costs up as construction vehicles wear out roads quicker, and we see growing demand for all our services. We also work with Bridget's team on how we can finance and fund the infrastructure needed to support new homes and jobs for Aucklanders. So how do we deal with these infrastructure challenges as a city? The refrain from local government has long been the same. Growth pays for growth. But is it this simple? If growth paid for growth and our current structures work, none of us would be here today discussing the infrastructure challenge. From the financial side, we see the challenge in two ways. Where the money comes from up, up front, the financing, and who pays in the end, the funding. So let's explore the financing first. The traditional BAU model is council delivered infrastructure with cost recovery through development contributions as development occurs. This is not sustainable. Not when the assets are pump stations or intersection upgrades that deliver for 20 years worth of growth in a specific area, and it takes this long to recover the investment. The financing is required for the whole period the DCs come in slowly over 20 or 30 years. This model is all minuses for our ratepayers. Investing in this, in this infrastructure creates debt that they can't use to improve their local stream, renew their rec centre, or upgrade their cycle paths. Equally, they are wearing all the risk that the development takes longer to arrive or doesn't arrive at all. So this is where the council's debt position comes in. At Auckland Council, we've been talking for a number of years about how we are at the limit of what we can prudently borrow. This was the case before COVID, and as Ross Copeland mentioned this morning, the impacts of the pandemic on our revenues have meant we've needed to limit our borrowing even more in the short term. So this is not an accident 
or the result of some form of mismanagement. We are at this limit because we are taking the hard decisions to invest in Auckland's future. Key investment decisions like the City Rail Link and the Central Interceptor will address existing congestion and water quality issues while providing bulk infrastructure for Auckland's growth. What this does mean, though, is that we are not in a position to finance additional large swathes of growth infrastructure across the city. And we need those large swathes of growth infrastructure. So financing is an issue. Then we have funding. Funding is an issue as well. Someone has to cover the costs in the end. When push comes to shove, there are only three people who can pay, the ratepayer, the taxpayer, or the landowner. If growth were to pay for growth, then the costs Bridget was talking about should be paid for the land by the landowner, right? Using our current approach, this would mean dramatic increases in the levels of development contributions. Would this work? What would this do to the commercial feasibility of those developments? And how do we think about affordability here? Then we look at our other two potential funders, ratepayers and taxpayers, and get into discussions about issues like spillover benefits. How do we weight causation versus benefit? How do we allocate benefit? Where do these outcomes rank in the investment prioritisations of our ratepayers and taxpayers? So, enough about the challenges. What are the opportunities? There are new tools in the funding and financing toolbox. Last year, Kate from the Treasury presented to this conference on their work addressing the challenges faced by growth councils. As a result, we now have the Infrastructure Funding and Financing Act the Minister of Finance spoke about this morning. The Minister spoke about the Mildow example, but we know this was special, with just one developer, and this is rare. In other areas, there will be further challenges. These will include questions about charging existing homes, who pays for spillover benefits to other communities, what are acceptable levels for a levy, and what will the development remain commercially viable. The benefits, though, are obvious providing a new way to enable infrastructure and therefore houses and jobs that otherwise could not be delivered. So the Minister spoke about the process, so let's get to the numbers. Do the numbers stack up and how much infrastructure could be delivered in an area through an IFF scheme? So to bring life to that, let's run through a hypothetical example. Imagine an area with the potential for, say, 5,000 new homes and each one of those properties was to pay around $1,500 a year in levy for 30 years. With current low interest rates, inflationary increases to the levy, and GST payable on it, then this sort of scheme could deliver over $150 million worth of investment over five years. How does that sound? It's a big number, $150 million. Does it sound like a price that might be acceptable, $1,500 a house? It sounds like lots of roads, pipes and playing fields to me, but is it enough to cover the sorts of challenges Bridget talked about earlier? She was talking about billions. If the IFF levy was set to raise a billion dollars on only 5,000 homes, then you'd need $10,000 per house to be acceptable. These are the types of questions we, like other growth councils and developers, are looking at and working on with Crown Infrastructure Partners and our other partners. Our proposition is that currently BAU doesn't work. We need a new approach to funding and finding infrastructure, a new BAU. We need to work out which opportunities and development areas will work, how we stage and sequence them, how we decide to use the tools we have, and how we solve any gaps. At a high level, we think the use of private finance to fund it, private capital to finance infrastructure needs to be a part of our new system. But we also know that decisions about how widely enabling IFF legislation will be used are needed. Will all beneficiaries be charged a levy? Can multiple levies be charged? How does affordability and commercial viability impact these decisions? So, our new BAU system is not there yet. We need to keep working on this. Tamaki Makoto is continuing to grow, and we need to support that growth with infrastructure. This is a challenge we cannot solve on our own, and we are working across our council family with Crown agencies and entities, 
and with the development community to face it. Together, we have come a long way over the past year. We have a much better understanding of the infrastructure that is needed in different parts of the city and what that might cost. We can't rely on our traditional methods of funding and financing and need to establish a new approach. We have new tools in the IFF and the UDA legislation to help us get there. The next step is finding a complete solution together. What infrastructure we need and how to pay for it. All to create well-functioning, quality urban environments. We look forward to the views of the following panels on these challenges and these opportunities. Thank you.